I don't know. But anyway, this is a lecture for my eight-hour class on uh, 331. Well, all right, I got this down too. Uh, you know, in this war, we're talking about the new weapons of war, gas, okay? This is the first time that gas was used in war. And the Germans developed this, and they're the first to use it, and it makes them look like Huns, barbarians, uncivilized people. And the first time that gas was deployed in battle was in a battle called the Battle of Ypres in Belgium. I'm not going to talk a lot about these World War I battles, but I want to put them up there. So in case in your future you ever hear about the Battle of Ypres, you'll know it was fought in World War I and not in Vietnam in 1915. And what happened was is that the Germans were attacking a group of Canadians, and these Canadians are standing there, and nobody knew what gas was. The Germans fired it in canisters about that long, fired it out of an artillery piece, and the thing would hit and just bounce and then start hissing at both ends. This grayish, yellowish smoke would start coming out, and it would just envelop these people and these Canadians. They never had seen anything like that. But they noticed that when that uh, cloud passed over their uh, soldiers, they would grab their throats and start choking. They didn't know what it was. Yes. I don't know that, uh, but it I operated. That's a good illustration. It operated like a smoke grenade, uh, you know, except it was spewing out gas instead of smoke. But there was a Canadian officer there. I guess he paid attention in, in the chemistry class because he, he knew he knew what it was, and he immediately pulled out his handkerchief and he peed his handkerchief and he threw it over his nose. Human urine, urine has ammonia in it, and ammonia, for a while, will act as a filter to poison gas. And he peed it and put that in, and he lived. And I've, I've given that lecture many times, and students go, ooh, put pee in your face. Well, then, okay, you just die. And you're just, gee, gee, what's what? Let me, let me think about this one. You know, pee in my face or dying. What's your, yeah. So anyway, uh, and you're right. After the uh, war, it was outlawed in 1923. Just, just, just two, yeah. Just, and there were two types, mustard gas, Mustard gas would choke you to death, and there was chlorine gas. Mustard gas would blind you too. There was chlorine gas, and if you got if you inhaled chlorine gas, like Adolf Hitler did, by the way, uh, if he was a brave soldier in World War One, he won the German Iron Cross. He was almost killed just a week or two before the war. Wouldn't that have been glorious? Uh, he he was he had a dangerous job. He ran, it would have been you know gee have we got to think about that hmm, would the world be better off without Hitler or not? Well I don't know Hitler had his good points. No you know it would have been much better off. And uh, he uh, was running a message between trenches and a gas canister hit and uh, he he didn't get his gas mask out at his time and he just fainted. And of course he was just there sucking in that gas and you know oh I don't know two more minutes and you'd have never heard about all Hitler. But another runner came along behind him, and that runner had his gas mask on, and he dragged Hitler to safety. And he lived. And as they say, the rest is history. But for the rest of his life, Hitler had this, he had bad lungs from that gas attack in World War I. Okay. So anyway, um, gas is used. Um, and uh, But I was going to say about chlorine gas, if you inhale that, you know, your lungs are healthy right now. They're as healthy as they will ever be. But if you just got a little whiff of chlorine gas, it could make your lungs look like the lungs of someone who had smoked three packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes a day for 40 years. Uh, and I mean, it would do it like that. Uh, kill you as dead as a hammer. It would be like ripping your lungs out of your body and throwing them on a hot barbecue grill. That's what chlorine gas does to it. Uh, there's the number one killer, the machine gun. That's a World War I machine gun. Uh, there, did I show you those trenches yesterday? Yeah. Okay, there are the trenches. There are some guys, you know, when they, those are Americans. They've even got gas masks for their mules, okay? Uh, they learn pretty quick. That's a famous painting. I think it's by a guy named John Senior Sergeant. He's a British, uh, yeah, right in that He's British, and, uh, you know, that's called gas. And there are young men all over the world on all sides of this. There were young men, uh, life just starting, went to war, and they were blinded. And there are a group of men, you see several of them laying there with their eyes bandaged, but there are people trying to make their way back. And the way you did is you put your hand on the shoulder of someone and you stumbled along until you got back to uh, uh, an aid station, okay? Also get this down, World War I, uh, I've got this out of line a little bit, but let me go, the tank, okay? The very first tanks used in warfare were used in World War I. 
you know, both sides were trying to figure out a way to break through the lines and they couldn't do it. And late in the war, there aren't very many tanks used in World War I, but late, late in the war, the British developed tanks. And of course that brings the question, and, and, and they worked. At the very end of the war, these tanks were able to, just a few of them, to go through the German lines. But it's too little too late. But the question is, why is a tank called a tank? Uh, they built these things in factories in London, and they knew that there were German spies and other British cities. They knew there were German spies all over the place. And, of course, once they built them, they had to take them on a test run somewhere so they could see if the, the things would work. And so they wanted to ship them up to Scotland to the Scottish Highlands. And if you've ever been up to Scottish Highlands, they're absolutely beautiful. But I've been there a couple of weeks. And let me tell you, when you're in the, if you want to go live isolated, go to the Scottish Highlands. Uh, you won't see anything but big rabbits. Uh, first time I ever stayed up there, I checked out a hotel and it was out in the country and I checked out a hotel and I decided it was one of the dark yet. I'd go on a walk and I was just out walking out there. It was beautiful. I mean, it's be and there are these gigantic rabbits all of a sudden that came. I thought I was in a science fiction movie, you know, these, and they were just everywhere. So that's about it. Uh, in North, but anyway, they were, they wanted to get them from London London up to Scotland. And so the way they disguised them, you know, World War I had a lot of horse cavalry in it. In fact, in many, there's some horse cavalry in World War II, but in many ways, London is, excuse me, World War I is the last great horse cavalry war. And they had to build these big metal tanks to hold water and ship them over to France where the British cavalry was. And so they said, aha. Uh -huh. So they started putting these things in big wooden crates and they would just stamp water tank on the side of it. And they dropped the water. And eventually this weapon that we still have today became known as the tank. And by the way, there's a modern day tank, a lot of firepower. That thing could roll right through those brick buildings like you could poke your pencil through a sheet of your paper there. That's how powerful they are. Hmm? Did the British have what? The tanks. Did the tanks have guns? They had two machine guns on them. They didn't have the... Artillery. Yeah, they didn't have that. Let me go back to that. See that? There it is. But you could shoot at, you know, I mean, if it took, if, 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 this, if this took a direct hit from a German uh, artillery, it, it would blow it to smithereens. But, you know, machine gun fire, which is the main thing they have to contend with, machine gun fire, it, it could go through that pretty good. But it's, at the end of the war, it's too little, too late. But it starts in World War One, And then there are airplanes. Get this down. This is the first air war, World War One. And, of course, uh, that's a British pilot right there. You can tell if that was in color, that circle would be red, white, and blue. The Royal Air Force, he's sitting there. He's got his machine gun up. Uh, it was a new weapon. They had to work a lot of kinks out of it. Uh, but uh, these World War I pilots, get this down, they were the most, the most heroic figures of the war. People looked on them like we look on astronauts today. They wore these leather caps. And these leather flight jackets, there's still people wearing uh, leather flight jackets, but they fit today. But the leather flight, is that one? Close enough. Okay, close enough. Yeah, well, there we go. Case in point. Uh, anyway, uh, and then they would wear a long silk scarf, scarf around their neck that their wife or their girlfriend back home or sweetheart had sent them. And, uh, you know, they're flying around in these planes, and, and the world has never seen anything like this. They, uh, uh, the early planes, you know, they, they made a couple of mistakes. Uh, first of all, uh, they didn't synchronize. You know, these are prop jobs. They're propellers, and they didn't synchronize the pr propeller with the machine gun. In other words, you've got your propeller going around, you've got your machine gun right here, and your machine gun's got to fire through that propeller. And they didn't synchronize it, and so, you know, here goes a... German plane, and here comes a British pilot in on that German plane to shoot it down, and he squeezes his trigger, and he shoots his own propeller off and crashes to the ground. So they had to go back to the drawing board on that. They carried their bombs in a basket between their knees, and they would just, and they don't really fly much higher than the lights at the football field. It's higher, but not much higher than that. And they would be flying around, and they would see a trench, and they would just drop bombs by hand. And, of course, that would irritate those people in those trenches, and they would take a rifle and shoot them out of the sky. It was possible. In fact, the most famous pilot of World War I gets shot by, I'm going to tell you that story in a minute, 
he got shot by an Australian down in a trench, just a guy on the ground. He said, oh, yeah, pow, shoot him. <laughs> yes. Were there any famous ace pilots? Ace pilots? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the aces. I'm going to show you some famous pilots. Uh, and speaking of aces, write this down. To, to, well, how many planes did you have to shoot down to be? Five. Huh? Five. 21. Okay, you had to shoot down 21 planes to be an ace. And all, oh, by the way, these guys would uh, uh, challenge each other to duels. A German pilot would say, he would send word over to the French lines, I'm going to be up over no man's land at 2 o'clock Sunday. Anybody want to challenge me, come out. And these two single planes would appear out there. And both sides would come out of their trenches and sit on the top of them and cheer their pilot. And they would fly around with pistols shooting at each other, okay, up there. Well, you know, they got tired of it, or one of them got killed, I guess. Uh, look at that. That's that's a modern-day plane. Uh, have any of you eaten Red Baron pizza? Do you like it? Is it good? Well, anyway, a lot of a lot of if you look on the Red Baron pizza, there's a guy with goggles on. He's got a leather cap and a scarf around his neck. People think that's just some advertisers advertisers' imagination. It's not. Uh, that's a modern day advertising stunt, but that's modeled on a World War I plane. It's got red, but this guy, write him down Manfred von Richtenhofen. That German, German. Yeah, Manfred von Richtenhofen. That's the most famous pilot of World War I. He was German. How many planes do you think he shot down? At least 30. 30? 30. 40. A lot of 40. I would say about 400. Oh. He shot down 80. He yeah, shot down. like it was too much. Yeah, I don't know. He shot down. He shot down 80 planes. He painted his plane red. Yes. Can you do what? Well, move. Come on. You ought to stay up here all the time. You do better. Anyway, shot down 80 planes. He painted his plane, his whole plane red. Because he wanted everybody on both sides to know who he was. And every Allied pilot wanted to shoot him down. He's only 25. And in the last two or three weeks of the war, he's flying up the Somme River Valley. The Somme River is in Belgium. If you think of your map, it's in Belgium. He's flying up and he's coming in on, and he already, Germany knew they'd lost the war, but I guess he wants to rack up as many points as he can. And he's right behind this British pilot about to shoot him down. And there's an Australian fighting for the British Empire. There's an Australian sitting down in the trench and he sees, and everybody knows the Red Baron, and he simply takes his rifle and pow, shoots him through the heart, and he crashes to the ground and killed him, and that was the end of the Red Baron. He didn't get his 81, he didn't get his 81 uh, putts. This guy, write him down, Eddie Rickenbacker. He's an American ace. I guess he's the most famous American ace. You see his machine guns there? See his leather cap? Yes. Doesn't the Ukraine have like an ace pilot or something like that? They may. They may. Yeah, they do now. Well, anyway, ace, I guess that, I, I don't know much about the Air Force. There's Eddie Rickenbacker, America's great ace. I guess he was the most famous one we had. So listen, I hope by this point, you know, Listen, I hope you can identify, you know, if you ever hear anyone talking about a war in which there was trench warfare, machine guns, mustard gas, over the no man's land, your mind ought to go to one war or one. So I hope you've learned that much. Uh, the war uh, took the world by surprise. The world had never seen a war like that, just like this. Just think about this. <clears throat> you know, the bloodiest war fought uh, between 1815 and 1914 was the American Civil War. And just think about this. At a battle, write this down. I'm not going to talk a lot about one battles, but when I do talk about one, I want you to write it down. If you ever hear of the Argonne Forest, you'll know it's a World War I battle. It wasn't fought in <clears throat> Operation Desert Storm. But anyway, the Argonne Forest. Let's think about this. At Argonne Forest, they fired more ammunition in three hours than had been fired in the entire American Civil War. I'll say that again. In three hours, they fired more rounds of ammunition 
than were fired in the entire American Civil War. Yes. How many shots were fired in the Civil War? Well, I don't know. You know, that would be interesting to look up. But uh, somebody did, and you know, they determined that more, more than in the entire, um, more than the entire uh, American Civil War in just three hours. Okay, that's that's how. The you know, and, and what happened between the Civil War and World War One, the Industrial Revolution? That's how the industrial. That's how much the Industrial Revolution increased the killing power of the human race in fifty years. All right. Well, I am going to talk a little bit about these two next battles. Get this down. Uh, I think they're the two bloodiest battles of World War One. The two bloodiest battles of World War One. One is the Battle of the Somme. Write this down. The Battle of the Somme. And again, the Somme is a river in Belgium. And this both these battles were fought in 1916. This battle was fought in 1916. And at this battle, these are the basic facts I want you to know about it. At this battle, it was the British versus the Germans. Okay? The British versus the Germans. While that battle was going on, let's see if I can, okay. The Somme is fought right up here. The British versus the Germans. At the same time, while that battle is going on right here, in eastern France, the Germans are trying to break through the French lines and capture Paris. Uh, and that results in a battle being fought at a place called Verdun. And I think these are the two worst uh, battles fought in France, 1916, <clears throat> French versus the Germans, or Germans versus the French. I think those are the two worst battles of World War I, and I want to do them very quickly, okay, very quickly. I think I've got just enough time to do it. Everybody got that information down? Okay. Everybody got that? All right. So here's what happened at the Battle of the Song. Get this down. Here's what happened at the Battle of the Song. Here you have the British lines, the trenches. Here you have the German lines. And here's what the British decided to do. Look. Germans, here are the British. And the British are trying to break through German lines and march all the way to Berlin and end the war. And so the British decided to do this. They decided to bombard the center of the German line. Let me see for how many days. They decided to bombard the center of the German lines for six days, 24 hours a day. So they pick out a section of the German lines and they bring up their most massive artillery guns and they shell that, you're with me, for six days. And the British idea was this. If we take that section and we just blast it, there won't be a grasshopper alive out there. We will literally blow a hole through the German lines. And when we literally blow a hole through the German lines, it will be safe then to send 11 divisions of men. That's 220,000 men. They'll be safe because there won't, you with me? There won't be any Germans left over there. And they'll just march through that hole, just keep right on going. 200, the, the British said, we're going to win the war today. And we'll march all the way to Berlin and the war will be over. Uh, well, so they started bombarding the, the German lines. And here's what happened. The German trenches collapsed on top of the German soldiers. Didn't kill them. Not kill some of them. Didn't kill them. It just covered them up. And there they were covered with dirt. And I mean as deep as from here to that ceiling with dirt and sandbags and beams. And they were holding on to those machine guns. But the artillery's pounding away, but all that earth on top of them saved them. And all of a sudden, after six days of bombardment, the bombardment stops just as quickly as it had started. And the Germans hear whistles blowing, just like you saw a while ago. That real World War I whistle. And they know an attack is coming. 
And so they dig themselves out and they set their machine guns back up and they just massacred the British. Get this down. The British lost 22,000 men in a day at the Battle of the Somme. By the way, what's the bloodiest day in American history? Antietam. How many men did we lose at Antietam? 4,800. 4,800. What I'm telling you is on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British had 40,000 wounded and 22,000 killed. It was the worst day in the history of the British Army. It still holds that distinction. And the British Army is a 1,000 years old. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Do you know how many men have to be hit? Uh, in, uh, you, know what it, you know what it takes to kill, you know, that number, you know, you, have 20, you know what it takes to kill 22,000 men in 11 hours? That means that 85 men have to be hit per second for 11 hours. 85 British men went down per second for 11 hours. That's what it takes to kill 22,000 men. Two. Hmm? Two. Yeah, well, and by the way, after this horrible defeat, what did the British generals do the next day? Do it again. Huh? Do it again. Do it again. They did it again. And after that, and say, and, and the next, and after that, what what did the British generals do? do it again. They did it again. Get this down: the Battle of the Somme lasted five months, and when it was all over, five hundred thousand British soldiers were dead. How many German soldiers died? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. If you put all the French and the Germans and the British, one point three million people killed and wounded. You got it? Killed and wounded. One point three million. A quarter of those were. British. Mm. About 450,000 were. How many were Germans? I would have to look up the numbers. But over a million people at this battle. And by the way, how far did the lines move? Nine. They didn't. They didn't. No, neither side achieved a breakthrough. Let's go quickly to the Battle of Verdun. Verdun is the longest battle in, in World War I. Maybe the longest battle in history. It lasted 11 months. It started in February, and it didn't end, it didn't end until December. The Germans were down in December. What? Were dead in December. Oh, I'd, I'd have to look that up. Just in December, it lasted eleven months, though. It uh, the German army attacked three hundred straight days, three hundred days in a row. You know, most people go through a battle that lasts a day or two; they're affected for life. Imagine these soldiers for three hundred days they fought. They and look, Verdun. Get this. It was a, it was an old medieval castle right here, and the French. You know, here's the Battle of the Somme going on, but the French are preparing down here for an attack. And of course, the French government knew that if the Germans broke through at Verdun, they would march 163 miles. They would be in Paris, and the war would be over. The commander. Get this down. And the French forces was a man named Philippe Pétain. Are there any portraits of him? Huh? Are there any portraits of him? Yeah, I could probably find one. I ought to have it up there. Philippe Beton. He's in command. If the Germans break through, they win the war. The president of France came down before the battle. He came down to Verdun. It was an old medieval castle. Okay. He came down to Verdun. And he told Beton, the fate of the nation is in your hands. If the Germans win here, they win the war if they break through your lines. And Pétain said this, get this down, they shall not pass. You ever see that quote associated with Verdun? They shall not pass. If you go to Verdun today, it is a huge cemetery, tens of thousands of Germans and Frenchmen. And over the gates of that cemetery are the words, they shall not pass. And for 11 months, the French held. They destroyed the French lines. By the way, the Germans introduced a very nasty weapon at this war battle, uh, flamethrower, flamethrower, liquid fire. Someone with a flamethrower could open that door and just hit a couple of squirts and incinerate everybody in this room. Yeah, How far could they reach? I don't know that. I don't know. But at quite a distance. I would say you could, from here to the middle of Miss Weeks' room, just a guess, and that may just be a guess. It may be as wrong as it can be. But anyway, they introduced that. These men, the trenches were destroyed, and so guess what? Men on both sides survived by living in shell holes. And you know, you think of a shell hole, you think, I'm talking about as, as big as half this room. 
but there would be 40 people in there and they were in there for months. They couldn't get out. If you stuck your head above the rim of that shell hole, a sniper would blow it off. So they urinated and they're defecated. They were half naked, their clothes, their shoes rotted. And they ran out of water. It was horrible for weeks. You know, tomorrow, just as a class experience, tonight at midnight, take your last drink of water and don't take another one until tomorrow night at midnight and see how that goes. And these guys, it went on for months. They actually collected their own urine and drank it to keep from dying. That's how horrible this battle was. But when it was all over, get this down, the French held. The Germans did not break through. The lines did not move. And hundreds of thousands had died again. To this very day, Get this down. To this very day, French farmers and German farmers and Belgian farmers plowing their fields, disking their fields, will park their tractor in the barn and start to leave. And if you've ever disked anything, you'll know a little dirt sticks to the disk and they'll look up and there'll be a finger there, skeleton of a finger or toes or a foot or a femur uh, or a rib cage that they dug up. They're still digging up bones of the dead soldiers. At Verdun, let me show you how ferocious this war was. At Verdun, the Germans wanted to break through the French lines and they picked a six mile section of the French lines and they rained down 100,000 shells per hour on that six mile long section of line. 100,000 shells per hour for 12 hours. At the Battle of Verdun, 40 million artillery shells were fired. That's one battle. 40 million artillery shells. You go visit that cemetery, you better be very careful. I have no doubts that they have not yet uh, reclaimed all the bombs. And some of them, I suspect, are alive. All the bombs at the Battle of Verdun. That's how horrible this war is. Write this battle down quickly. I'm out of time. Write this battle down. The Battle of Passchendaele. I'm just going to give you the name of that. The Battle of Passchendaele. 300,000 British soldiers died at Passchendaele. And this right here, and we're, we're going to, tomorrow after the test, we will do this. But that right there is the monument. That's called the Menin Gate. British soldiers on the way to Passchendaele, marched across that bridge. And they have built over that, this monument with the names of hundreds of thousands of British soldiers inside. Uh, and that's in Belgium, Passchendaele's in Belgium. And every day since 1928, it took them that long, 10 years after the war, they had that monument built. But every day since 1928, at eight o'clock, a British bugler will march out there. They'll stop the traffic. You can see there's a van going, but they'll stop the traffic, and he will stand there, and he will play the last post. Have you, have you ever heard taps? Yeah. Have you ever heard taps? That's what we play to honor our dead. The British have a song called The Last Post. In fact, tomorrow after the test, I'll play both of those. Study for your tests.
Dude, her laugh in English today, all oh, wrong. <laughs> I made them all laugh. Oh, I don't remember what you said, but it was funny. He said, like, you're like, what the mom? I was like, you know, you got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got one and a half. Ew. What makes that happen? Uh, yeah. Half of her brain is <laughs> meth and half of it is crazy, so I guess I got one. A brain can be made out of meth. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bull crap. Yeah, you train to play. You don't look inside of her brain, you're going to like find muscle. Now, I don't know my brain. <laughs> My mom posted the meth in the meth attic. Sorry. That is the best place to know. We get a little bit too comfortable right now. Melissa Schaefer, please come to the front to get on the bus. Melissa Schaefer. How often do they call that real name? I don't even know. She probably is longer. It's always Melissa. That's what my mother's name is. That's yeah. what my dad's ex wife is. Trust me. Which one? <laughs> Melissa. Which one? Which mother? <laughs> Methy. So sad. Good time. Question. If your mom's a meth addict, what no, are you going to call her? Mom. 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 No. No. Is she your bio mom? No, she was a nine month apartment. What? Oh, that's that's oh, okay. Yeah. I got confused for a you second. Got a big <laughs> <laughs> On November 16th, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> but I mean, are you going to call the person that yes. gave you a mom? And you never knew her. I doubt that's I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I used to call my dad that one. I call her a nine month of harm and straight to her face. Yeah, I might know that she's going to try something to get back to that. Oh, she's going to threaten to kill you. Yeah, let's say, yeah. Are we all got issues? I like the album too. So we all do. I'm going to ask for you. I'm just kidding. Dude, and she's back in rehab, and then I got to throw it. Damn, did that do right there? There's some things you don't touch. You prop that up, and please, thank you. Oh, what? Prop you prop up. that up, and please, thank you.
Hannah and Chastity P, please come to the office if you are in the building. Please come to the office. 